Our first lesson this morning is found in Isaiah 60, verses 1 through 6. And if you'd like to follow along in the Pew Bible, you'll find this uh, reading in the Old Testament on page 690. Listen for the word of the Lord. Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. For darkness shall cover the earth, and thick darkness the peoples. But the Lord will arise upon you, and his glory will appear over you. Nations shall come to your light, and kings to the brightness of your dawn. Lift up your eyes and look around. They all gather together. They come to you. Your sons shall come from far away, and your daughters shall be carried on the nurses' arms. Then you shall see and be radiant. Your heart shall thrill and rejoice, because the abundance of the sea shall be brought to you. The wealth of the nations shall come to you. A multitude of camels shall cover you, the young camels of Midian and Ephah. All those from Sheba shall come. They shall bring gold and frankincense and shall proclaim the praise of the Lord. Our second lesson is found in Ephesians 3, verses 1 through 12. And again, if you'd like to read along in the Pew Bible, you may do so in the New Testament at page 193. Listen further for the word of the Lord. This is the reason that I, Paul, am a prisoner for Christ Jesus for the sake of you Gentiles. For surely you have already heard of the commission of God's grace that was given me for you, and how the mystery was made known to me by revelation, as I wrote above in a few words, a reading of which will enable you to perceive my understanding of the mystery of Christ. In former generations, this mystery was not made known to humankind, as it has now been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. That is, the Gentiles have become fellow heirs, members of the same body, and sharers in the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. Of this gospel, I have become a servant according to the gift of God's grace that was given to me by the working of his power. Although I am the very least of all the saints, this grace was given to me to bring to the Gentiles the news of the boundless riches of Christ and to make everyone see what is the plan of the mystery hidden for ages in God who created all things, so that through the church, the wisdom of God in its rich variety might now be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. This was in accordance with the eternal purpose that he has carried out in Christ Jesus our Lord, in whom we have access to God in boldness and confidence through faith in him. The word of the Lord. Friends of Christ, let us turn to God in prayer. Your word is a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. In our anxiety and in our fear, O oh God, we would prefer that you would illuminate the entire rest of our path so that we can know exactly where we are going and how things will unfold. But what you promise us is to walk with us and to illuminate for us the next step on our journey. And so we pray to you to shine your light upon us in our individual lives, in our life as a congregation, and in our life as a society and a planet, to show us the next step where we should go. We pray these things in the name of your word made flesh, Jesus Christ. Amen. So Christmas break does not always turn out the way you expect, and things don't always go the way you want. Um, on a personal note and level, 
This past week, my family and I were visiting my mom and dad in North Carolina, during which time my father ended up in the hospital. And at first, when we went to the hospital, we were worried that he might be having a heart attack. Um, but in time, the doctors said that his heart seemed fine. However, there was a mass on his pancreas, um, which has turned out to become the subject of our family's great concern. Um, we are still awaiting the final, absolutely final results from the pathology tests of that mass um, and expect them to come in the next uh, day or two. But it seems possible and even likely that pancreatic cancer and the treatment protocols for that are in our future. And I want to share that with you this morning um, because it seems pretty possible and even likely that I may be a little distracted in the coming weeks and months and may be even a little more weepy than I usually am. And especially as an only child, uh, there will very likely be some days when I will need to be down in North Carolina uh, with my family. My father's in good hands with his doctors in the Charlotte area, and I do not anticipate a whole lot of interruption in my duties here, um, though there will undoubtedly be some. And I'll be working closely with the other staff, with the personnel committee, and with the session uh, to begin to be sure uh, that things continue moving along here in a decent and orderly uh, fashion. But your prayers for my father, for my mother, um, for uh, my wife, who is learning all kinds of new things about how my family of origin operates uh, through this, um, and for our children. Your prayers are much appreciated, and I will keep you um, posted as we uh, go along. On a more global scale in recent days, the conflicted relationship between the United States and Iran has entered a new chapter with assaults on an American air base and on the U.S. Embassy in Baghdad as the United States killed a high-ranking Iranian general who was responsible for designing and implementing weapons and attacks that maimed and killed many American troops, and there are serious concerns about retaliation going forward. Impeachment proceedings are very much in the air, and the conflict and the gaps between our two major parties continue in their divisive slog, all in the context of a highly fraught presidential election. There were stabbings at, a synagogue, at synagogues in New York um, recently, and Mary Fraze shared the news that in that area, in congregations both Jewish and Christian, there has been aggressive vandalism there. Bushfires are burning in Australia. Our friends in the United Methodist Church are on the cusp of a major split over disagreements about LGBT clergy and same-sex weddings. There's a lot going on, a lot going on, and it is easy to feel overwhelmed. On Epiphany Sunday, as we approach the 12th day of Christmas tomorrow, the church gathers to mark and to celebrate the revelation of the light of God in Jesus Christ. This is the day when we particularly remember the revelation of the light of Christ to the Magi from the East who were Gentile astrologers who did not even share the same religious framework as Mother Mary and Joseph. Revelation through the star that rose over the place where the child born to be king of the Jews would be born. And what the texts of Epiphany want to tell us one of the things they want to tell us, both the text that Pam read for us as well as the text from Matthew chapter 2, which we did not read this morning but which we are singing, texts want us to remember that the light of God does not shine in a vacuum. The light of God shines in darkness. 
The child born in the manger was not born into a plush, padded, totally safe environment. The child was born into a context of violence and threat. As King Herod, in Matthew chapter 2, threatened and then implemented violent death to all of the children under age 2 in the surrounding area out of a fear of the one child who might threaten his grip on power. So when Isaiah 60 speaks of darkness covering the earth and thick darkness or gloom covering the nations, this is one of those years, I don't remember exactly how this has been in the past, but this is one of those years where that does not really feel like poetic exaggeration. Whether we are talking about the crises and the difficulties that come to us in our personal lives, or the conflicts and warfare and disasters in the lives of nations, biblical words about darkness have a way of hitting pretty close to home. There are occasionally folks who will say that the Bible is just filled with all this lofty speech that doesn't really have much to do with real life. But I think that those folks must just not be reading the Bible because the Bible tends to be remarkably clear-eyed and grounded in reality. But it is also the case that our texts today and generally do not only speak about darkness because the gospel does not only speak about darkness, nor does it only speak about brokenness, nor only about disease or illness, nor only about sin. Our text this morning and the gospel more generally speaks of the light that shines in the darkness. And because of the light, darkness is made bearable. It is not made, it is not done away with exactly but it is made bearable. It is not quite so fearsome, nor so dreadful. Because, Isaiah 60 says, your light has already come. The glory of the Lord has risen upon you. It's done. It's not maybe one day in the future if you're lucky. The glory of the Lord has risen upon you. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not overcome it. And just in case we're thinking this is all some sort of motivational speech, we should note that the reason the darkness is bearable for Isaiah is not because Isaiah is a super brave guy. And the reason the darkness does not ruin the church is not because the church is filled with lots of brave people. The reason the darkness is no longer so dreadful is because we live in the midst of and under the power of the glory of the Lord. And what we may mean, and what we may see in these texts and in these poems and in these stories, two things about the light. The light comes to us and the light goes before us. The light comes to us and the light goes before us. And it is surely a big, big part of what makes the gospel good news that the light of God is not something we have to gin up or manufacture for ourselves. The light of God comes to us from beyond us. It gets inside of you, but it does not come from inside of you. You do not have to generate the light that will lead you into life because the light comes from outside of you and it rises upon you. And so it occurs to me that for everyone, and I know that there are some of these folk in this room who can be tempted to believe that it is up to us to save the world or to save our church or to save our families. This is a very important piece of news that it is not up to us. And, and I know that there are also some of these folk in the room. There's at least one of each of these standing in the pulpit. So I know there's at least one, <laughs> if not more. For everyone who can from time to time be inclined to despair over the situation in your personal life 
or the situation of our community or our society or our world, this is also an important piece of news because the news is that there is no darkness that is so deep. There is no darkness that is so deep that the light of Christ is not present. That is the promise, the news of epiphany. Now you will have noticed for some time that the formula that we use here at Lewinsville in the assurance of forgiveness is friends hear and believe the good news that comes to us from God. The reason that is the formula that we use is because those are two separate things. It is entirely possible to hear the good news but not really believe it. We are invited, friends, to hear it and we are invited to believe it. But it is also the case that the light of Christ is not just something that is within us, that comes within us. The light of Christ goes before us just as the star went before the Magi. And it goes before us to show us the way that we should go. And you will remember from that story that the star followed by their dreams, so you need to pay attention to your dreams as well, the star followed by the, by the dreams guided the Magi so that they knew where to go because there were real threats that they faced. And because the light that we are following is the light of Jesus Christ and not just some vague kind of blah light, because it is the light of Jesus Christ, it is not just a pretty star that makes us feel warm and fuzzy. The light of Jesus Christ is the light of justice and it is the light of peace. And both of those aspects of the light of Jesus Christ are crucial. And both aspects are crucial because the world characteristically wants to split them apart from each other and pursue one or pursue the other. On the one hand, there are some of us in the world who want justice and who are far too quick and far too ready to use violent means in order to pursue justice and then to simply accept any collateral damage that may come as just being the price of doing justice. And on the other hand, there are some of us in the world who want peace and who are far too quick and far too willing to tolerate and to turn a blind eye to wicked, terrible, destructive behavior on the part of others and then to say that is just the price of doing peace. But Jesus Christ, our Lord, holds together the light of justice and the light of peace. And because he does it, and then you will have noticed that what he typically says to us throughout the Gospels is, follow me. I think what that means is because he holds the light of justice and the light of peace, not being willing to give up on either one of them, but to hold them together and let them inform each other. Because he does it, we can as well. But we should be forewarned that when we do that, when we pursue both justice and peace, it may very well mean that the justice-only people, as well as the peace-only people, will be mad at us for doing that. But that may be the price of doing discipleship. So the mystery of the gospel of Jesus Christ, which is described in the letter to the Ephesians chapter 3, the mystery which is revealed in the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus, which is revealed in Ephesians 3 to be an inclusive gospel, inviting even Good Lord, even the Gentiles are invited. The mystery of the gospel of Jesus is that death is the seedbed of life. And what many of us know is that what we would prefer is not that. What we would prefer is uninterrupted safety and happiness and lifetimes, and security, and control, and power. And entire industries of fear and commerce have grown up around our desire to avoid loss and death. But our Lord Jesus teaches us that death 
though it be hard and though it be awful, death is not the final end for us. Death is the seedbed of new life. That is the news that we both need to hear, but that we wish there were some other way. But we say this stuff all the time. We say Easter Sunday only comes out of Good Friday. We say the light shines in the darkness. We say God's power is revealed in weakness. We say the first will be last and the last will be first. We say unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it can only be a single seed. But when it dies, it bears a whole lot of fruit. And on and on and on. The news of epiphany, and it is the resilient news by which you and I live, is that the light of God is at work in every single situation. Whether it be a situation in our own personal lives or a situation in our world, the light of God is at work in every situation bringing forth God's future. To God and to God alone be all the glory. Amen. Friends, let us pray. We are deeply grateful for your promise, O oh God, that you are the God who brings new life out of death. But we are also afraid of your news because we wish that there were some other way. But even in our fear and our resistance to that gospel, we are also aware that it is the gospel that we most desperately hunger for. And so we pray that you would continue to shape us by the experiences of our lives, by your word and scripture, by your Holy Spirit, and by our participation in the life of this congregation. We pray that you would shape us into people who are prepared to host your word and to bear witness to it in our deeds, in our actions, and in our words. All of these things we pray in the name of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.